In the near future, every object on Earth will be generating data, including our homes, our cars, even our bodies. Almost everything we do today leaves a trail of digital exhaust, a perpetual stream of text, location data, and other information that will live on well after each of us is long gone. We are now being exposed to as much information in a single day as our 15th century ancestors were exposed to in their entire lifetime. But we need to be very careful because in this vast ocean of data, there's a frighteningly complete picture of us. Where we live, where we go, what we buy, what we say. It's all being recorded and stored forever. This is the story of an extraordinary revolution that's sweeping almost invisibly through our lives and about how our planet is beginning to develop a nervous system with each of us acting as human sensors. This is the human face of big data. All these devices and machines and everything we're building these days, whether it's phones or computers or cars or refrigerators or throwing off data. Information is being extracted out of toll booths, out of parking spaces, out of internet searches, out of Facebook, out of your phone. Tablets, photographs, videos. Every single thing that you do leaves a digital trace. The exhaust or evidence of, of humans interacting with technology and what side effect that has, and that's literally, it's just this massive amount of data. What we're doing is we're measuring things more than we ever have. It's that active measurement that produces data. If you were some omniscient god, and you could look at the footprints of electric devices, you could kind of see the world. The whole world is being recorded in real time. You can see everything that's going on in the world through the footprints. I think it's a lot like written language, right? It's just, at some point, they got to the point where you had to start writing it down. You just got to the point where it wouldn't work unless we wrote it down. We're sort of in the same point where, well, it ain't going to work unless we write all the data down and then look at it. And all that data coming in is big data. We estimate that by 2020, uh, the data volumes will be at about 40 zettabytes. Just to put it in perspective, if you were to add up every single grain of sand on the planet and multiply that by 75, that would be 40 zettabytes of information. All of the data processing we did in the last two years is more than all the data processing we did in the last 3,000 years. And so the more information we get, the larger the problems will be that we solve. Every powerful tool has a dark side every last one. Anything that's gonna change the world, by definition, has to be able to change it for the worse, as much as for the better. It doesn't work one way without the other. When it comes to big data, a lot of people are very nervous. Data can be used in any number of ways that you're either aware of or you're not. The less aware of the use of that data that you are, the less power you have in the coming society we're going to live. We're sort of just in the beginning of this big data thing. You don't know how it's gonna change your thing. You just know it is. The first real data set to change everything in the world was the astronomical data set, meticulously collected over tens of years by Copernicus, that ultimately revealed, even though the sun seemed to be moving over the sky every morning and every night, the sun is not moving. It is we who are moving, it is we who are spinning. It happened again when we suddenly could see beneath the visible level, and the microscope in the 1650s and 60s opened up the invisible world. And we, for the first time, were seeing cells and bacteria and creatures that we couldn't imagine were there. It then happened again when we revealed the atomic world, when we said, wait a second, there's a level below the optical microscope where we could begin to see things at billionths of a meter, the nanometer scale, where we imagined the atom and the nucleus and the electron, where we understood light as electromagnetic frequencies. But now, there's actually a super visible world coming into play. Ironically, big data is a microscope 
we're now collecting exabytes and petabytes of data, and we're looking through that microscope using incredibly powerful algorithms to see what we would never see before. Before, what we did was we, we thought of things, and then we wrote it down, and that became knowledge. Big data is kind of the opposite. You have a pile of data that isn't knowledge, really, until you start looking at it and noticing, wait, maybe if you shift it this way and you shift it this way, this turns into this interesting piece of information. I think that the BDAD moment, you know, before data, after data moment, is really searched. That was the moment at which we got a tool uh, that was used by hundreds of millions of people within a few years where we could navigate an incredible amount of information. We took all of human knowledge that was in text, right, and we put it on the web. And we thought to ourselves, well, we're done. Wow, that was hard. And now we realize that was the first minute of the first inning <laughs> of the game, right? Because that was just the knowledge we already had and the knowledge that we continue to add to the web at a, at a relatively slow pace, you know? Um, but there is so much more information that we have not digitized and so much more information that we're about to take advantage of. In recent years, our technology has allowed us to store and process mass quantities of data. Visualizing that data will allow us to see complex systems function, see patterns and meaning in ways that were previously impossible. Almost everything is measurable and quantifiable. So when I look at data, what's exciting to me is kind of recontextualizing that data and taking it and putting it back into a form that we can perceive, understand, talk about, um, think about. This is the data for airplane traffic over North America for a 24-hour period. When it's visualized, you see everything starts to fade to black as everyone goes to sleep. Then on the west coast, planes start moving across on red-eye flights to the east. And you see everyone waking up on the east coast, followed by European flights in the upper right-hand corner. I think it's one thing to say that there's 140,000 planes being monitored by the federal government at any one time. And it's another thing to see that system as it ebbs and flows in front of you. These are text messages being sent in the city of Amsterdam on December 31st. You're seeing the daily flow of text messages from different parts of the city until we approach midnight where everyone says, It takes people or programs or algorithms to connect it all together to make sense of it. And, and that's what's important. We have every single action that we do um, in this world is triggering off some amount of data. Um, and most of that data is meaningless until someone adds some interpretation of it, someone adds a, a narrative around it. Often we, we sort of think of data as stranded numbers, but they're tethered to, to things. And if we follow those tethers in, in the right ways, then we can find the, the real world objects and the real world stories that were there. So a lot of the work is, is that kind of work. It's almost investigative work of, of trying to follow that trail from the data to what actually happened. Sometimes the power of large data sets isn't immediately obvious. Google Flu Trends is a great example of taking a look at a massive corpus of data and deriving somewhat tangential information that can actually be really valuable. Until recently, the only way to detect a flu epidemic was by accumulating information submitted by doctors about patient visits, a process that took about two weeks to reach the CDC. So the researchers turned it around. They asked themselves if they could predict a flu outbreak in real time simply using data from online searches. So they set out to do the near impossible, searching the searches, billions of them, spanning five years to see if user queries could tell them something. When we do searches on Google, we all think of it as a one-way street, that we're going into Google and extracting information from Google. One of the things we don't really think about very much is we're actually contributing information back simply by doing the search. And that's where the breakthrough occurred. 
In looking at all the data, they saw that not only did the number of flu-related searches correlate with the people who had the flu, but they also could identify the search terms that could let them accurately predict flu outbreaks up to two weeks before the CDC. The CDC system takes about a week or two for the numbers to sort of fully flow in. What Google could do is to say, based on our model, we'll have it on the spot. We'll just run the algorithm uh, based on how people are searching right now. And now we have, for the first time, this real-time feedback loop where we can see in real time what's going on and respond to it. Now, there is a flip side to this, though, and that is there was a big story this year that there was a lot of media attention about what an intense flu season this was. And so what did that do? That drove up search. Uh, that drove people who were more interested in what's going on with this flu, or it might have uh, made more people think, I must have it. And so they were off. They got it way wrong. So, you know, one way to think about big data and all of the computational tools that we wrap around that big data to let us discover patterns that are in the data is when we point all that machinery at ourselves. At MIT, Deb Roy and his colleagues wanted to see if they could understand how children acquire language. And we realized that no one really knew for a simple reason. There was no data. After he and his wife, Rupal, brought their newborn son home from the hospital, they did what every normal parent would do, mount a camera in the ceiling of each room in their home and record every moment of their lives for two years. A mere 200 gigabytes of data recorded every day. We ended up transcribing somewhere between eight and nine million words of speech. And as soon as we had that, we could go and identify the exact moment where my son first said uh, a new word. We started calling them births. We took this idea of a word birth and we started thinking about, why don't we trace back in time and look at the gestation period for that word? One example of this was water. So we looked at every time my son heard the word water, what was happening? Where in the house were they? How were they moving about? And using that visual information to capture something about the context within which the words are used. We call them wordscapes. Then we could ask the question, how does the wordscape associated with a word predict when my son will actually start using that word. What they learned from watching Deb's son was that the texture of the wordscapes had predictive power. If most of the previous research had indicated that the way language was learned was through repetition, then this analysis of the data showed that it wasn't actually repetition that generated learning, but context. Words with more distinct wordscapes, that is, words heard in many varied locations, would be learned first. Not only is that true, but the wordscapes are far more predictive of when a word will be learned than the frequency, the number of times it's actually heard. It's like we're building a new kind of instrument, like we're building a microscope, and we're able to examine something that is around us, but there, it has a structure and patterns and beauty that are invisible without the right instruments. And all of this data is opening up to our ability to, to perceive things around us. A lot of people don't realise that when a baby is born premature, it can develop infection in the hospital and it can kill them. In our research, we started to just look at infection. By the time the baby is physically showing signs of having infection, they are very, very unwell. So the very first time that I went into a neonatal intensive care unit, I was amazed by the sights, the sound, the smell, just the whole environment. But mainly for me, the data. What shocked me was the amount of data loss. They showed me the paper chart that the information's recorded onto. One number every hour for the baby's heart rate, the respiration, the blood oxygen. Now in that time, 
The baby's heart has beaten more than 7,000 times. They've breathed more than 2,000 times. And the monitor showing the blood oxygen level has showed that more than 3,500 times. I said, well, where's all the data going that's in those machines? And they said, oh, it scrolls out of memory. So we have an enormous amount of data loss. So we're trying to gather that information and use it over a longer time in much more complex ways than before. And we try and write computing code to look at the trends in the monitors and the trends in the data to see how that can tell us when a baby's becoming unwell. So Dr. McGregor did what data scientists do. She looked for the invisible. She and her team analyzed the data from thousands of heartbeats, and what they discovered were minute fluctuations that could predict the onset of life-threatening infections long before physical symptoms appeared. When the body first starts dealing with infection, there are these subtle changes, and that's why we have to watch every single heartbeat. And what we're finding is that when you're starting to become unwell, the heart's ability to react, to speed up and slow down, gets subdued. The human body has always been exhibiting these certain things. The difference is we've started to gather more information about the body now so that we can build this virtual person. The better we have the virtual representation, then the better we can start to understand what will happen to them in the future. Back in 1999, I was pregnant with my first child. She was born premature and she passed away. There was no other viable outcome for her. But there are so many others who have just been born early and they just need that opportunity to grow and develop. We want to let the computers monitor a baby as it breathes, as its heart beats, as it sleeps, so that these algorithms are watching for certain behaviours and if something starts to go wrong for that baby, we have the ability to intervene. If we can just save one life, then for me personally, it's already worthwhile. Everybody understands uh, what it takes to digitize uh, photography, a movie, uh, a magazine, newspaper, but they haven't yet uh, grasp what it means to digitize the medical essence of a human being. Everything about us now that's medically relevant can be captured. With sensors, we can digitize all of our metrics. And with imaging, we can digitize our anatomy. And with our sequence of our DNA, we can, can digitize our biology. The data story in the genome is the fact that we have six billion data points sitting in our genomes that we've never had access to before. When you sequence a person's genome, there are known differences in the human genome that can predict a risk for a disease or that you're a carrier for a disease or that you have a certain ancestry. There's a lot of information packed in the genome that we're starting to learn more and more about. Getting your own personal information through your genome uh, would not have been uh, possible even 10 years ago because of costs. The technologies that have enabled this have dropped precipitously, and now we're able to get a, a really good look at your genome for under $500. And when it becomes 100 bucks or 10 bucks, we're going to have everyone's genome as data. The results came back on, on Tuesday, it was October 2nd, 1996. I was diagnosed that day with breast cancer. A year out of treatment, I found a lump on the other breast in the exact same position, and I went in, and they told me that I had breast cancer again. Sedona's known about me being tested for the BRCA gene. She's known my sister has tested. She knows my other sister tested and was negative for the gene mutation. And so she actually told me, when I'm 18, I want to test, you know, and see if I have this gene mutation or not. I am going to be completely distraught if I hand this gene down to my kid. Uh, do you know what your chances are of having the mutation that your mom has? I'd say 50-50. You're exactly right.
BRCA2 is a gene that we all have. It's called a tumor suppressor gene. But women do have a mutation in the gene that causes the gene not to function like it should. So the risk mainly of breast and ovarian cancer is a lot higher than in the general population. An average woman would have a 12% risk of getting breast cancer in her lifetime, and most women aren't going out there getting preventive mastectomies. But when you're faced with an 87% risk of getting breast cancer in your lifetime, um, it kind of makes that a possible choice. I'll need to swish this mouthwash for 30 seconds. We are definitely moving into a world where the patient or the person is at the center of things and, and hopefully also at the controls. People will have access to the data that is informative around the type of disease they have. And that data then can point much more directly to proper treatments. But the data can also say that a treatment works for a person or it doesn't work for a person based on their genetic profile. And we're going to start moving more and more into this notion of personalized medicine as we learn more about the genome and the study of pharmacogenetics, which is how do our genes influence the drugs we take. Ultimately, instead of treating disease, is there data that could really help us move away from contracting these illnesses to begin with and go more toward a preventive model? You know, you can't talk about information separate from health. How you feel is information, how you respond to a drug is information, your genetic code is information. What's really happening is we're gonna start collecting it, we're gonna start seeing it, and we're gonna start interpreting it. We're beginning the age of collecting information from sensors that are cheap and ubiquitous, that we can process continuously, and we can actually start knowing things. If we monitored our health throughout the day continuously, every second, what would that really enable? And there's now a lot of uh, really great technology coming out around this sense of tracking and monitoring. And we have all kinds of sensor companies and devices. We're actually collecting a lot of physiological information, you know, heart rate, breathing, in real time, you know, every minute, every second. People wanting to measure their daily activities and being able to track your own sleep, being able to watch and monitor your own food uptake, being able to track your own movement. It's almost like looking down at our lives from 30,000 feet. There's a company right now in Boston that can actually predict that you're going to get depressed two days before you get depressed. And the gentleman who created it said, if you actually watch any one of us, most people have a very discernible pattern of behavior. And for the first week, our software basically determines what your normal pattern is. And then two days before you're showing any outward signs of depression, the amount of tweets and emails that you're sending go down. Your radius of travel starts shrinking, the amount of time that you spend at home goes up. You can look to see if how you exercise changes your social behavior, if what you eat changes how you sleep, and how that impacts your medical claims. All kinds of data and information are sitting inside the world you do every day. Now, with all these devices, we have real-time information, real-time understanding. Now, that might sound interesting, might help you shed a few pounds, realize you're eating too many potato chips and sitting around too much, perhaps, and that's useful to you individually. But if hundreds of millions of people do that, you have a big cloud of data about people's behavior that can be crawled through by pattern recognition algorithms. And doctors and health policy officials can start to see patterns that change the way collectively as a society we understand not just our health, but every single area where data can be applied because we start to understand how we might collectively as a culture change our behavior. And if you look at the future of this, we're going to be embedded in a sea of information services that are connected to massive databases in the cloud. If you take a look at everything that you touch in everyday life, the majority of these things were invented many, 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 many years ago. And they're ripe for reinvention. And when they get reinvented, they're going to be connected. They're going to be connected in some way. That data that comes off of these devices that you touch is going to be collected and stored in a central location. And people are going to run big data algorithms on this data. And then you're going to get the feedback of the collective whole rather than the individual. 
So it's taking people who are already out there, already have these devices, and turning all these people into contributors of information back to the system. You become one of the, the nodes on the network. I think the internet, as wondrous as it's been over the last 20 years, was like a layer that needed to be in place for all these sensors and devices to be able to communicate with each other. You know, we're building this global brain that has these new functions, uh, and we're accessing them primarily now through our mobile devices, obviously also on our, our desktops, but increasingly mobile. I think this, this data revolution has a strange impact, really, of people feeling like there's somebody listening to them. And that could mean listening in the sense of Big Brother, uh, someone's listening in, or it could be someone's really hearing me. This device in my hand knows who I am. It, it, it can somewhat anticipate what I want or where I'm going and react to that. The implications of that are huge for the decisions that we make and for the systems that we're part of. I think about living in a city and how your experience of living in that city would be in 10 or 15 years. You've got places like Chicago where they're being hugely innovative and they're taking massive data sets, combining them in interesting ways, running interesting algorithms on them and figuring out ways that they can intervene in this system to sort of see patterns and be able to react to those patterns. When you take in data, it, it affects you as an individual, and then you affect the system, and that affects the data again. And this round trip that you start to see yourself part of makes me understand that I'm an actor in a larger system. For instance, if you know by looking at the data, and you have to put different data sets together to be able to see this, that some of the street lights, you know, when they go out, they cause higher crime in that particular block. You start to see ways that if you can query that data in intelligent ways, that you can prioritize the limited resources that you have in a city to take care of the things that have, you know, follow-on effects and follow-on costs. In the end, you know, you're going to hope that this is just our reaction as a species to this scale problem, right? How do you get another, you know, two billion people on the planet? You can't do it unless you start instrumenting every little thing and dialing it in just right. You know, right now you wait for the bus because the bus is coming on a particular schedule. And it's great. We're now at the point where your phone will tell you when the bus is really coming, not just when the bus is scheduled to come. You know, take that a little bit forward. What about when there's more use on one line than the other? Well, instead of sticking with the schedule, does the system start to understand that um, maybe this route doesn't need 10 buses today and automatically shift those resources over the lines where the buses are full. Boston just created a new smartphone app which uses the accelerometer in your phone. So if you're driving through the streets of South Boston and all of a sudden there's a big dip in the street, the phone realizes it. So anybody in the city of Boston that has this app and running is feeding real-time data on the quality of the roads to the city of Boston. Then you start to feel that your city is sort of a responsive organism, just like your body puts your blood where it needs it. Think about ways that we could live in cities when they're that responsive to our needs and think about the implications of that for the planet, because really, cities are also really how we're going to survive the 21st century. You can live in a city with a far smaller footprint than, than anywhere else in the world, and I think data and sort of the res responsive systems will play an enormous role in that. I think one of the most exciting things about data is that you know, it's, it's kind of, it's giving us extra senses. It's expanding upon, you know, our, uh, you know, our ability to perceive the world. And it, it actually ends up giving us the opportunity to make, make things tangible again, and to actually get a perspective on ourselves, both as individuals and also as society. And there's always that moment in, in data visualization where you're looking at, you know, tons and tons and tons of data. The point is, not to look at the tons and tons and tons of data, but what are the stories that emerge out of it. You said, look, give me the home street address of everyone who entered New York State prison last year. 
and the home street address of everyone who left New York State Prison last year. And we said, look, let's get the numbers, put it on, on a map, and actually show it to people. And when we first produced our Brooklyn map, which was the first one we did, they hit the floor. Not because nobody knew this. You know, everyone knew anecdotally how concentrated um, the effect of incarceration was, but no one had actually seen it based on actual data. We started to show these remarkably uh, intensive concentrations of people going in and out of prison, highly disproportionately located in very small areas around the city. And what we found is that the home addresses of incarcerated people correlates very highly with poverty and with people of color. You had a justice system which, by all accounts, is supposed to be essentially based on a case-by-case -case individual decision of justice. But when you looked at the map over time, what you really were seeing was this mass population um, movement out and mass population resettlement back, this cyclical movement of people. So once we had mapped the data, we quantified it in terms of how much it cost to house those same people in prison. And that's where we started to think about million dollar blocks. We found over 35 individual city blocks in Brooklyn alone, for which the state was spending more than a million dollars every year to remove and return people to prison. We needed to reframe that conversation. And what immediately emerged out of this was this idea of justice reinvestment. We weren't building anything in those places for those dollars. How can we demand sort of more equity for that investment to extract those neighborhoods from what decades of criminalization has done? And that shift had to come from the data and a new way of thinking about information. These maps did that. The amount of data that now is being collected about those areas that have that are stuck in cycles of poverty, cycles of, of famine, cycles of, of, of war, gives people or governments and NGOs an opportunity to do good. Understanding on the ground, information on the ground, data on the ground can change the way people apply resources which are intended to try to help. We really fundamentally believe that data has intrinsic value. And we also fundamentally believe that the individuals who create that data um, should be able to benefit from that data. We're working with one of the big mobile phone operators in Kenya. We're looking at the dynamics of these mobile phone subscribers. Millions of phones in Kenya. We're looking at how the population was moving over the country. And we're overlaying that movement data with data about parasite prevalence from household surveys and data from hospitals. We can start identifying these malaria hotspots, regions within Kenya um, that desperately needed the eradication dollars. It's fascinating to start extracting models and plotting graphs of the behavior of you know, tens of millions of people in Kenya, but it's meaningful when you can make those insights count when you can take the insights that you've gleaned and put them into practice and measure what the impact was. And hopefully making the lives of the people who are generating this data better. That afternoon when the earthquake struck um, in January, I was watching CNN and saw the breaking news and I had my wife in Port-au-Prince at the time and for the better part of 12 hours, had no idea whether anyone of my friends were alive or dead. Meyer was a Tufts University PhD student and directed crisis mapping for Yushihidi, a nonprofit that collects, visualizes, and then maps crisis data. And so I went on social media and I found dozens and dozens of Haitians tweeting live about the damage. And a lot of the time they were sharing where this damage was happening. So they would say the, the church on the corner of X and Y has been destroyed or has collapsed. 
and they would refer to street names and so on. So it was about really becoming a digital detective and trying to understand where on the map this was. So he called everyone he knew and put together a mostly volunteer team in Boston to prioritize the most life and death tweets and map them for rescue workers. For the first time, it wasn't the government emergency management organization that had the best data of what was happening, but it was legions of volunteers that came together and crowd mapped the location of buildings that had collapsed, people that were trapped in rubble, locations where water was needed, where physicians were needed, and the like. I think we've seen, not only in Haiti, but almost every disaster since Haiti, just an explosion of social media content. Disaster mapping groups like Myers realized that there was so much at stake and so much raw data coming from social media during natural disasters, they needed to come up with new algorithms to sort through the flood of information. We are drawing on artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, working with data scientists to develop semi-automated ways to extract relevant, informative, and actionable information from social media during disasters. So one of our projects is called Artificial Intelligence for Disaster Response. During the Hurricane Sandy, we collected five million tweets during the first few days. With the Sandy data, we've been able to show empirically that we can automatically identify whether or not a tweet has been written by an eyewitness. So somebody who is writing something saying the bridge is down, we can say it with a degree of accuracy of about 80% and higher whether that tweet has actually been posted by an eyewitness, which is really important for disaster response. I think that goes to the heart of why something like social media and Twitter is so important. Having these millions of eyes and ears on the ground, it's about empowering the crowd. It's about empowering those who are affected and those who want to help. These are real lives that we're capturing. This is not abstract information. These are real people who are affected by disasters, who are trying to either help or seek help. It doesn't get more real than this. Today, technology um, allows, and, and a lot of our communication tools, allows an idea to be spread instantly and with the original source of truth. I can have an idea and I can decide that I want to bring this around the world and I can do it almost instantaneously. Tunisia is a great example. There were little uprisings happening all over Tunisia um, and each one was brutally squashed and there was no media attention so no one knew that any other little village had an issue. Um, but what happened was in one village there was a, the man who, who self-immolated it in protest and the images um, were put online by uh, a dissident group um, onto Facebook. And then Al Jazeera picked it up and broadcasted the image across the Arab region. And then all of Tunisia realized, wait a second, we're about to have an uprising, and it just went. So Tunisia was really activists on the ground, social media, and mainstream media working together, spreading across Tunisia this idea that you're not the only ones, and it gave everyone the courage to do the uprising. Technology has fundamentally changed the way people interact with government. That's another layer of this stack that's sort of being opened up. I think that's one of the key challenges of big data. It has so much opportunity for both good and for also really screwing up our system. You can't talk about data without talking about people because people create the data and people utilize the data. So a handful of years ago, there's a guy named Andrew Pohl, who is a statistician who gets hired by Target. He's sitting at his desk and some guys from the marketing department come by and they say, look, if we wanted to figure out which of our customers are pregnant, could you tell us that? So what Andrew Pohl started doing is he said, the women who had signed up for the baby registry, let's track what they're buying and see if there's any patterns. I mean, obviously, if someone starts buying a crib or a stroller, you know they're pregnant. But by using all of this data they had collected, they were able to start seeing these patterns that you couldn't actually guess at. 
when women were in their second trimester, they suddenly stopped buying scented lotion and started buying unscented lotion. And about at the end of their second trimester, the beginning of their third trimester, they would start buying a lot of cotton balls and washcloths. And then they could start to subtly send you coupons for things that might be related to your pregnancy. They decided to do a little test case. So they send out some of these ads to a local community. And a couple weeks later, this father comes into one of the stores and he's furious. And he's got a flyer in his hand that was sent to his house and he finds the manager. And he says to the manager, he says, look, I'm so upset. It, you know, my daughter is 18 years old. I, I don't know what you're doing sending her this trash. You sent her these coupons for diapers and for cribs and for nursing equipment. She's 18 years old and it's like you're encouraging her to get pregnant. Now the manager who has no idea what's going on with the, the pregnancy prediction machine that Andrew Polt built says, look, I'm so sorry. I apologize, it, 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 it's not gonna happen again. And a couple days later, the guy feels so bad about this that he calls the father at home and he says to the father, I'm I just wanted to apologize again, I'm so sorry this happened. And the father kind of pauses for a moment. He says, well, I want you to know, I had a conversation with my daughter and um, there's been some activities in my household that I haven't been aware of and she's due in August, so I owe you an apology. And when I asked Andrew Pohl about this, before he stopped talking to me, before Target told him that he couldn't talk to me anymore, and he said, oh look, like you gotta understand, like this science is just at the beginning, like we're still playing with what we can figure out about your life. Everybody who's on Facebook is involved in a transaction in which they're donating their data to Facebook, who then sells their data. And in return, they get the service which allows them to post pictures and connect to their friends and so on and so on and so on and so on. That's the transaction. But nobody knows that's the transaction. Most people, I think, don't understand that. They just literally think they're getting Facebook for free. And, and it's not a free thing. We're paying for it by, by allowing uh, them access to our data. There are a lot of people on Facebook who don't know, for example, how much information is really out there about themselves and probably, and, and apparently don't care as long as they can put up pictures of their cats. I think most people, when they think about privacy, they don't seem to connect their willingness to share their personal information with the world, either through social media or through shopping online or anything else. They don't seem to equate that with surveillance. Every time I receive a text message, every time I make a phone call, my location is being recorded. That data about me is being pushed off to a server that is owned by my mobile operator. If I call that mobile phone operator and say, hey, I'd like to have my data, please. At a minimum, share it with me. I'd like to see my, my locations over time. They won't give it to me the increased ability of these devices that we have to become recording and sensing ob objects, so data collection devices essentially in public space, that, that changes a lot of things. Even if the phone company took away all of your personal identifying information, it would know within about 30 centimeters where you woke up every morning and where you went to work every day and the path that you took and who you were walking with. And so even if they didn't know who you are, they know who you are. What I'm really worried about is the cost to democracy. Now, today, it's nearly impossible to be truly anonymous. And so, so, so the ability to everything to be connected to you and for everything you do in the real world to be connected to everything you're doing in cyberspace, and then the ability for whoever it is to take that, put it together, and turn it into a story. My fear really is that once there's so much data out there and once governments and companies start to be able to use that data to profile people, to filter them out, everybody is going to start to worry about their activities. We're at a very, very important point where I think our society has come to realize this fact and just begun in earnest to debate the implications of it. You have, I think, an attitude in the NSA that they have a right to every bit of information they can collect. We have constructed a world where the government is collecting secretly 
all of the data it can on each individual citizen, whether that individual citizen has done anything or not. They have been collecting massive amounts of data through cell phone providers, internet providers, that is then sifted through secretly by people over whom no democratic institution has effective control. There's a feeling that if you're not communing with terrorists, what do you care if the government gathers your information? This is probably the most pernicious anti-Bill of Rights line of thought that there is, because these are rights we hold in common. Every violation of somebody else's rights is a violation of yours. What's going to happen, I think, is that we now have so much information out there about ourselves and the ability for people to abuse it. People are going to get hurt. People are going to lose their jobs. People are going to get divorced. People are going to get killed. And it's going to become really painful. And everyone's going to realize we have to do something about this. And then we're going to start to change. Now, the question is, how bad is it? You can't have a secret operation validated by a secret court based on secret evidence in a democratic republic. So the system closes and no, no information gets out except it gets leaked or it gets dumped on the world by outside actors, whether that's WikiLeaks or whether that's Bradley Manning or whether that's Edward Snowden. That's the way that people find out what their government is up to. We're living in a future where we've lost our right to privacy. We've given it away for convenience sake in our economic and social lives, and we've lost it for fear's sake vis-a-vis -vis our government. Anytime you're looking at an ability to segment, analyze, you've got to think about both sides. But there's so much good here. There's so much chance to improve the quality of life that to basically close the box and say, you know what, we're not going to look at all this information, we're not going to collect it, that's not practical. What we're going to have to do is think as a community. We have cultures that have never been in dialogue with more than 100 or 200 or 400 people now connected to 3 billion. The phone is the on-ramp to the information network. Once you're on the information network, you're in. Everybody's in. Billions and billions of people who have been excluded from the discussion, who couldn't afford to step into the world of being connected, step into the world of information, step into the world of being able to learn things they could never learn, are suddenly on the network. The world of the internet from an innovation perspective has pushed innovation out of large institutions to people on the edges. I suspect as we uh, equip these next billion consumers with these devices that connect them with the rest of the world and with the internet, we'll have a lot to learn about how they use them. All of these people in these countries are now connecting with each other, sharing data about um, prices of crops, prices of parts. The Africans are talking to the Chinese who are talking to the Indians, and the world is connected in its nooks and crannies. The person that is in Rwanda that has their first phone that now has access to an education system that they never could have dreamed of before can start finding solutions for his or her little town, his or her village. Once we have that ability to connect people, and they are able to be connected, there's going to be some genius, you know, in some remote location who would never have been discovered, who would never have had the capability uh, to get to the education, to get to the resources that he or she needs. And that young woman is going to change the world rather than just changing her village. The idea that that genius will be able to find his or her way into the greater culture through the tiny little two by two window of a feature phone is very exciting. A billion people in India, a billion people in China, you know, you're talking, you know, 500 million to a billion in Africa. Suddenly the world has a lot more minds connected in the simplest, least expensive possible way to make the world better. So you look at the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, is the internet and the data revolution associated with it of that scale? It's certainly possible. 
I don't think there's any question that we're at a moment in human history that we will look back on in 50 or 100 years and say, right around 2000 or so, it all changed. And I do think we will date uh, before the explosion of data and after. I don't think it's an issue of climate change or health or jobs. I think it's all issues. Everything has information at its core, everything. So if information matters, then reorganizing the entire information network of the planet is like wiring up the brain of a two-year-old child. Suddenly that child can talk and think and act and, and behave, right? The world is wiring up a cerebral cortex, if you will, of billions of connected elements that are going to exchange billions of ideas, billions of points of knowledge, and billions of ways of working together. Together, they become this enormous wave of change. And, and that way of change is going to take us in directions that we can't begin to imagine. The ability to, to, to turn that data into actionable insight is what computers are very good at. The ability to take action is what we're really good at. And I think it's really important to separate those two because people conflate them and get scared and think the computers are taking over. The computers are this extraordinary tool that we have at our disposal to accelerate our ability to solve the problems that, frankly, we've gotten ourselves into. I am fundamentally optimistic, but I'm not blindly, foolishly optimistic. You gotta remember, the financial crisis was brought to us by big data people as well, because they weren't actually thinking very hard about how do they create value for the world, they were just thinking about how do they create value for themselves. You know, we have a fair amount of literature, a fair amount of understanding that if you take more out of the ecosystem than you put back in, uh, the whole thing breaks down. That's why I think we have to actually earn our future. We can't just sort of pat ourselves on the back and think it's just gonna fall into our laps. We have to care about what kind of future we're making. And we have to invest in that future. And we have to make the right choices. It is, to me, paramount that a culture understand, our culture understands that we must take this data thing as ours, that we are the platform for it. Humans, individuals are the platform for it. That it is not something done to us, but rather it is ours to do with something as we wish. When I was young, we landed on the moon. And so the future to me meant going further than that. We looked outward. Today, I think there's a new energy around the future and it has much more to do with looking at where we are now and, 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 and the globe we stand on and solving for that. The tools that are in our hands now are going to allow us to do that. Now it's like, no, wait a minute. This is our place and we're gonna figure out how to make it